Hi, I'm Jim Wiggins. Thanks for watching us today. First off, I'd like to welcome you to Cybersecurity Today. This is our inaugural episode of this broadcast. Cybersecurity Today is designed to provide you, the viewer, an inside look at the topic of cybersecurity. You've probably heard the term cybersecurity on TV or in the press, but maybe you don't know what it really means. On this show, we will be demystifying what it means and bring you interesting and relevant content to understand the themes and trends that are impacting what we refer to as the cyber domain. No matter your background, we intend to bring useful and relevant information on how cybersecurity impacts you, your family, and even the organization you work for. So who am I? Well, for the past 23 years, I've been an educator, teaching students and corporations how to protect and defend their computer systems. My background's pretty diverse. I grew up originally building and maintaining computer networks back in the mid to late 90s. Then, in the early 2000s, I realized that while we were building all of these network environments, the one thing we weren't doing was figuring out how to protect and defend those same assets. So I transitioned to the security side of the house, and for the past 18 years, I've specialized in cyber education. Today, I run my own company that does cyber training and consulting within the cybersecurity industry. Okay, so now that I've talked a little about myself and hopefully earned your trust, let's talk about the show. Today's show will be broken into three topics. The first topic is current events. We're calling this Cyber News Bits. The second topic will be an interview with a cybersecurity professional on a type of malicious software known as ransomware. We're going to delve into what ransomware is, how it works, and what impact it might have to you and your organization. And the third topic will be an interview with another cybersecurity professional on the topic of supply chain risk management. If you've never heard of supply chain risk management, we'll provide you insight into the risk when you buy a product that is sourced from around the globe. By the way, very few products are made 100% in the US anymore, so you'll want to stay with us and learn about what organizations are doing to manage their risk when they source parts from around the world. Let's go ahead and get into the cyber news bits. Microsoft recently began what they call the end of life phase for both Windows 7 and Windows 2000 server in January of 2020. The company has stopped supporting Windows 7 on laptops and desktops and Windows Server 2008 on company servers. This means Microsoft will no longer patch it with security updates. This move will force users and organizations to update to Windows 10 and later versions of the Windows Server operating system to maintain security updates moving forward. Security patches are being released all the time for software products like operating systems and end user applications. So this move will result, will result in significant risk for those who don't take steps to upgrade soon. Extended support will be available for both operating systems, but at a significant annual fee. While some corporations may decide it makes sense to pay for the extended support, for the average user at home, the options are better to simply upgrade to Windows 10. In other news, a Senate bill would create a state cybersecurity set of coordinators. A new bill was introduced in the U.S. Senate recently that would require the Department of Homeland Security to establish a cybersecurity state coordinator program. The Department of Homeland Security and its newly formed agency known as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA, currently helps operationalize cybersecurity for civilian agencies, state, local, tribal, and critical infrastructure areas. This proposed legislation would require each state to have its own cybersecurity coordinator. This coordinator would be responsible for responding to cybersecurity threats by working with federal, state, and local government, as well as community organizations like schools, hospitals, utilities, and other entities. The various state coordinators would be charged with improving coordination between federal, state, and non-federal entities. They would also be responsible for the preparation, response, and remediation efforts relating to cybersecurity risks and incidents. Further, the coordinator would facilitate the sharing of cyber threat information that the federal government has available to help prevent cyber threats at the state and local level. In other news, Seattle will be the first in the nation to use mobile voting this year, Seattle area voters will be able to use their smartphones, laptops, or computers at their local library to vote in a current election. This will be the first time online voting is available to all eligible registered voters, and Seattle will be the first in the nation to allow their residents to vote from the convenience of their personal devices. 
This is a concern in the cybersecurity community as nation states, such as Russia, have used cyber attacks to disrupt the presidential elections, most notably in 2016. Due to this, cyber experts have been in opposition to mobile voting. Many cite the lack of advancements in the technology to protect the voting process, while others cite the internet is not secure enough place for something as important as the election process. Another news article that's of relevant to you is that Google is talking about blocking HTTP file downloads. In April of 2019, Google proposed that all internet browser makers begin to block file downloads that use the unencrypted protocol HTTP when a user initiates the file download from a connection from a more secure session using what's called HTTPS. This would prevent users from downloading content from a website in an unsecured manner when they had established a secure connection via HTTPS. Google has announced it will formally be moving ahead with last year's proposal and would be making changes to the Chrome browser going forward with version 83 of their Chrome browser. This version of the browser is expected to be released in June of 2020. Chrome will be blocking downloads that it considers risky. The plan is to block insecure downloads on sites that appear to be secure, loaded via HTTPS, but where the downloads aren't, in other words, being loaded via HTTP. Another news article that might impact you is that malicious code targets what we call industrial control systems. This is quite interesting. A security company known as Dragos recently discovered a type of malware known as ransomware targeting industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are the computer systems which run power, water, and nuclear facilities for most of the nation. The ransomware malicious software was identified as ECANS. It is the first kind of ransomware intended to infect industrial control systems. The researchers determined that the ransomware was designed uh, to disrupt the industrial control system processes on end user devices. The information on these devices is encrypted and the information is really held hostage until a fee is paid to the attacker, usually by something called Bitcoin. Dragos, the company that uh, identified it, stated that ECAN, spelled backwards, is known as Snake, initially emerged in December of 2019 and targets Windows systems that are used in industrial environments. On a quick note, we're going to have a segment shortly on what ransomware is, so in that segment we'll talk more about what it is, why this is a concern for many users and organizations. In another news article, uh, a leaked report reveals that the United Nations was hacked last year. A report has appeared online indicating that the United Nations suffered a cyber attack in July of 2019. According to the report, the attackers compromised dozens of uh, UN servers located in Europe. The cyber attacks allowed the attackers to access huge volumes of data. The breach servers allowed the attackers to pilfer staff details, health insurance, and other UN information. The report says that the perpetrators potentially exploited a vulnerability in Microsoft SharePoint to access the network. The report indicated that malware was used in the attack, but that specific malware was currently unknown or was not specified. The UN did not disclose this attack. Our last news article for today talks a little bit about how a cyber attack using ransomware cost the city of Dunwoody, Georgia at least $80,000. Over the Christmas of 2019, the city of Dunwoody, Georgia was the target of a ransomware attack. Officials acting fast were able to mitigate the risk, but several computers had to be wiped clean and reloaded. It was a few days before all operations were completely restored. The unknown perpetrators attempted to exploit an undisclosed, uh, excuse me, extort an undisclosed fee from the city of Dunwoody to be paid via Bitcoin, but the city refused. Some operations were impacted during the recovery process. Most notably, police officers had to revert to manually writing tickets versus using an online process. The city ended up having to pay at least $80,000 to clean a, uh, to a security consulting firm to help with the cleanup. No data was reported lost in the attack. That brings you up to date on the current set of news in the cyber community. We'll see you on the other side. I'm here today talking with Mr. Christopher Vias. Christopher has been working in information technology 
since 2003 in the dim pre-smartphone past. <laughs> Over the years, he has supported IT deployments, operations, and security in multiple organizations in local and state governments, higher education, and the private sector. He now works as a cybersecurity professional for the federal government, helping to secure our nation. Christopher holds degrees from Stetson University and the University of Maryland Global Campus, and is a certified information system security professional, also known as a CISSP. Do you mind if I call you Chris? No, Chris is fine. Great, thank you. Uh, we want to talk to Chris about what seems like just part of our digital landscape now, ransomware. In 2020, maybe you've heard of ransomware on the news about a government or private sector organization being affected, or maybe from a company's information technology office. But you may be wondering, what is it exactly? Or how does it work? And perhaps more importantly, what can I do to keep from being a victim? Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about what ans ransomware is? Sure, and thanks for having me here today, Jim. Um, ransomware, like you said, it's kind of become an ever-present part of our digital landscape, and it's essentially a computer virus or malware that takes control of a computer and locks it up until a ransom is paid. Um, this can take a couple of different forms. There are some that just lock the screen, kind of like a screensaver gone bad, until a, a special code is entered. Um, and the, there are some that are far more dangerous and they'll actually scramble your data, what's referred to as encryption, and they'll hold that data for ransom until some sort of condition is met, usually a monetary payment. Got it, got it, okay. So it's a little different than a virus or a, a worm that we normally think of, got it, okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the historical, uh, you know, how long has it been around? Does uh, just speak a little bit about, you know, the, the history of ransomware. Sure, so there were some early ransomwares popping up as far back as the 80s. Um, they were fairly benign, they didn't cause a lot of damage. Um, a few more popped up uh, after a dormant period in the early 2000s, around 2003, 2004, uh, but we didn't really see a resurgence until 2013 with the CryptoLocker. Got it, and that was, of course, a huge news story uh, a couple of years ago. Sure, so CryptoLocker was a very successful malware. It spawned uh, a whole host of copycats, I guess you could call it, or, or subsequent variants. WannaCry was another very big news story um, that people may have heard of. CryptoLocker was novel in a couple of different key ways. It combined two new technologies to the ransomware method into what was a very sophisticated and effective package. So it combined one, military-grade encryption, with two, holding the key to unlock the ransomware on a remote server. So previous ransomwares had stored the key on the same infected computer, so sometimes forensic analysts and other experts could get that key and undo the damage, but with CryptoLocker, that key was not even on the same computer, it was somewhere else where no one could get to it. Um, that was coupled with a rise in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, which wasn't strictly related to ransomware, but it did serve as an anonymous, reasonably anonymous way to transfer money. So it got adopted by these bad actors as their primary method for demanding their ransom payment. So is it safe to say that the intersection of those two ideas that you just conveyed is one of the reasons that we've seen a rise in ransomware since, like, say, 2013? That's definitely the case. Um, the ease of demanding that anonymous payment over the Internet that's not related to any sort of fi you know, normal financial institution um, really emboldened uh, malware you know, spreaders and bad actors to use this as a way to get money out of people. Got it, got it. Okay. Um, so I guess my next question then uh, kind of goes to, um, you know, what if I've already got antivirus software on my computer? Um, should I really worry? Is my antivirus going to be able to adequately protect me from ransomware? So it's possible that it may. Um, one of the key things about the ransomware uh, since WannaCry and beyond is that it uses normal or, or more established methods of spreading viruses, worms, and other things that have been around for decades now. Um, you know, that's hijacked websites or advertisements, um, emails with uh, dangerous attachments as a way to get into your computer system. Now, a lot of times, antivirus can recognize 
the kind of bad carrier that's bringing the ransomware into your computer and stop it, but it can't stop all of them and new ones are constantly being made. Got it, got it. Can you talk a little bit about the financial impact of, of ransomware in terms of you know, payment demands that have been made or uh, cost to organizations? Sure, so cost to organizations um, can vary widely, uh, but we see anywhere from $500 to over $150,000 we've seen. When public sector institutions are attacked, that number jumps to over $300,000 in many cases. Wow, wow. Um, how many of these types of attacks do you, do you see actually out there on an annualized basis? It seems like these attacks kind of peaked with a spike in 2016, over 600 million known instances, possibly even more unknown or unreported. Um, since that time, a lot of the uh, defenses we have, antivirus and others, have kind of caught up a little bit with this sort of pseudo arms race. And so that has leveled off. The last couple of years, we've seen about 200 million or so, um, but it's starting to trend back upwards a little bit. Got it, got it. Okay, so you know we we're talking a little bit about this from the organizational perspective, but what about private citizens that are out mm -hmm. there? Uh, uh, you know, our families, our, our aunts, our uncles, our, our parents. How does this affect them? Right. So you may be thinking, um, and from the news, you'd be right that most of that you hear about this is of organizations being attacked, uh, large companies public sector institutions like governments, state, local, even some federal. Um, and the reason that those are make news stories is because usually the demands for money are quite high and the effect is often very bad. It often uh, denies services, disrupts normal functioning of these big organizations that play a large part in our everyday lives. Um, but for individuals, the risk is, is just as um, relevant and the reason, I mean, aside from the, the costs that, you know, and grab a lot of attention in headlines, it's, it's just that they have more computers at these organizations, so they're statistically more likely to be affected. But from a computer system to computer system, there's no difference between their, you know, computer and, and yours at home. In fact, theirs might even have more defenses than yours. Got it. Yeah. Well, I'd really hate to have my computer locked up and have my work encrypted and not be able to have access to it. So Yeah, that would be a huge hassle for anybody. Um, it could even be potentially catastrophic for some people. Um, we all have things like tax records, legal documents stored in our computers. If, the, if that's the only copy of that document and it gets encrypted or held for ransom uh, and is lost, that could be devastating to some people. Not to mention, I mean, that's just talking about you know, important legal records, but things like sentimental digital files, so videos, photos, your kids, like, I mean, the, we all live digital lives now with all this information that's, that's potentially at risk if we don't take some steps to ensure that we're protected. So can we talk about that for a minute? Can we talk about you know, some mitigation or some steps that maybe individuals and maybe even companies, I don't know if there's a difference between what companies might do versus mm -hmm. what individuals might do to try to mitigate these kinds of threats? Sure, so there is some overlap there. Um, and we can go through some of them. A few are you know, a little more specific to, uh, to organizations, but a lot of overlap uh, on, on the ones that are most effective. Um, so yeah, so let's start with backups. That's probably the number one way to protect yourself, whether you're you know, a single person with a laptop to uh, an organization with thousands of, of employees and, and staff. Um, keeping adequate backups is the single most important thing you can do. Um, the reason that's so is because ransomware is very advanced at this point. If your computer that is affected can see the storage where you have this data, the ransomware can encrypt it. Got it. Um, that's why in your backup plan or strategy, um, it's important to have an offline backup of those things that you consider to be most important. Um, Cloud storage is also a great way to mitigate this. Um, a lot of the cloud storage options are built with special protections against ransomware and are able to roll back changes like an encryption attack um, so that you can recover your data. Okay, are there any other steps you could take to, to try to mitigate? You said uh, backups and you said look at cloud. How about sure. training, does that play a sure. role? If you're an organization, um, user training is still seen as one of the most effective uh, means to counter this because the ransomware leverages known attacks like faulty email attachments or other traditional ways that viruses and other malware can get onto your network systems. Got it. Um, let's see. Any other steps? Sure. 
Making sure your computers and devices are up to date for an organization, this takes the form of robust patch management, um, which if you're you know, a decision maker in your organization, you can talk to your IT department, make sure that they're, this is something that they're following up with. For a private citizen, um, it's as simple as keeping things up to date, which you know, we all know and we all fall behind on. Um, but if we can automate as much of that as possible, turning on auto updates for things like your, your mobile devices, your Windows and Apple computers, your home router is a thing that's often overlooked. Um, and I guess, well, finally, one of the other things is be careful of the networks that you connect your devices to. Um, if you're an organization, make sure that you're keeping an eye on what's allowed to connect to your network and what's not. Um, consider using a guest network for visitors or people that need to access your network um, that aren't part of your organization. Um, and for private citizens, uh, be mindful of publicly available uh, Wi-Fi networks like coffee shops, airports, that kind of thing. Those often can be ways that your computer can become infected, even if it's not with a ransomware attack. Initially, it could be a way for someone to load one on later on. Got it. Okay, well, uh, Christopher Villas, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and, and sharing your expertise on ransomware. Hopefully, we've given some good information to people and made the case that ransomware can affect anyone, but the steps to protect against it are doable and help with many other types of risks as well. With that, we're going to end this segment. We're going to move to our next segment where we're going to be talking to a different cybersecurity professional on the topic of cybersecurity supply chain risk management. We'll see you in a little bit. I wish I was in school. If only I had a math test today. I'll stay after class. I'll clean the chalkboard. I wish I was in school. School ends, but free lunches for your kids don't have to. Find your local food bank at feedingamerica.org slash summer meals for help. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. I'm here now with Cindy Munoz talking about cyber supply chain risk management. Cindy Munoz is a Southern California native and now resides in the Washington DC metropolitan area. Currently, she supports the public sector as a cybersecurity analyst in a variety of cybersecurity initiatives and also as an adjunct professor. Cindy has numerous cybersecurity uh, certifications. Cindy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, I'm excited to be here. So Cindy, um, I know your background is a little bit in cyber supply chain management. So can you, for our audience, define exactly what cyber supply chain risk management is about? Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, National Institute for Standards of Technology um, def defines cyber supply chain risk management as the process of identifying, assessing, mitigating um, the risks associated with the distributed and interconnected nature of IoT and IT product and service supply chains. Um, this covers the entire life cycle of a service or product. Got it. And so, so why does it matter for an individual or even for an organization? So these type of attacks um, undermine all the security controls within an organization. So this is often considered like a worst case scenario type of t attack um, and it really compromises um, the company basically like from the inside out. C can you explain like how the attack occurs just from a high level perspective? Like is it injecting itself into software? Or is it injecting itself into hardware? How is it getting it into the actual supply chain? It could be any of the above. So there's so many moving parts and pieces within the supply chain that can be like anywhere from hundreds to thousands to even millions of individual pieces that um, all put together into this product or service. Um, you don't always know who's um, touching that uh, hardware. Um, you don't know who's touching a motherboard or you don't know um, if somebody has um, coded some, um, some vulnerability into your software. Um, it could be a person that has, um, didn't practice uh, um, good cyber hygiene, or it could be um, even just a natural occurring event, a natural disaster. Got it. So if I go out there and I buy a product, let's say a widget, and that widget is manufactured in the United States, 
am I okay or do I have to worry about the fact that they might have sourced that product from maybe other countries? Well, that's that's the, the question because it can vulnerabilities um, can be implanted even if it's um, created here in the US. It's just you don't always um, know 100% um, what's happening outside um, when you receive your uh, your, if you buy a laptop, if you, um, you don't know who had touched the laptop before you. So I assume there are actors, maybe in other countries, for example, mm -hmm. that could inject software into a product that could ultimately uh, touch us here in the United States. Exactly. Actually, an example of that, um, it was a few years ago, but um, Kaspersky antivirus, was, there were concerns that maybe it was um, feeding information back to servers um, in their home country um, that could be used to um, gain access to information um, and ha be able to have that uh, information for potentially um, the wrong reasons. And Kapersky is an antivirus company, I believe, like Symantec or uh, uh, McAfee or yes. those, correct? Yeah. I see. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about some high profile cases besides Kapersky that uh, have impacted, you know, in the supply chain area? Yeah, so another, um, probably arguably the most famous supply chain um, breach was uh, Target. Um, in the 2013-2014 holiday season, their um, systems were breached by a third party HVAC vendor. Um, and that was able to steal millions and millions of customers' information, and they lost a lot of customer confidence and ultimately their their you know, their profits. Got it. And how did that attack occur? How did they inject themselves into the supply chain? Um, through a third-party HVAC vendor. I see. Uh, yeah. So they got into the actual supply chain of the actual processes of Target, and ultimately, okay, I got yeah. it. That makes so, sense. So even when you get a, a third party, um, they're also bringing in their potential vulnerabilities. Um, so you really got to make sure you uh, basically do your homework. Got it. Um, can you talk for a minute about mitigation methods that organizations and maybe even individuals might look at for, for trying to address this issue? Yeah, so um, really researching, taking your time to see the footsteps of your hardware and software um, components, um, what the, pro the company's processes go into that and making sure you're securing what's most important to your organization. Got it, got it. All right, with that, we're gonna go ahead and end today's session. Thanks, Cindy, for coming in and uh, spending some time with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely, and uh, we wanna thank you as our viewers for, for watching our first inaugural episode of Cybersecurity Today. We hope that uh, today's episode was informative and interesting, and we look forward to seeing you again soon in the future and on our next episode. Have a great day, thank you very much.